Welcome to your Optimal Personal Economy podcast with Justin Bennett. Your personal economy is your ability to create, protect, preserve, and utilize your wealth, your financial world. Justin will share strategies and stories to help you optimize your personal economy. Now, on to the show with Justin Bennett and co-host Matt Halloran. Hello and welcome to episode number eight with Justin Bennett. Today we're talking about money for today and money for tomorrow. So Justin, before we really unpack all of this, what do you mean by saying that title, money for today and money for tomorrow? In our previous podcast episode, we talked about how savings rates make such a large impact on one's planning. And so what we had concluded was that there's some, there needs to be some structure. There needs to be some discipline around how we do that. And so we utilize what we call a wealth coordination account. We call it the WCA. And what we have found is that most people, when they don't do planning, they have the vast majority or 100% of their income get directly deposited and go into a checking account. And then, you know, that may go in once or twice a month. And then they, on a fairly blind basis, start to spend money, you know, every day from the first of the month to the end of the month. And money just flows out of the account. Mm -hmm. And that money is for today, right? That's money to support their lifestyle. And what ends up happening is at the end of the month, there's sometimes zero or even a negative. Mm. And so there becomes this challenge of capturing money that they would truly want to earmark and create discipline around for tomorrow. Tomorrow could be literally the following day or what we typically talk about when we say tomorrow is some future point in time when they're going to rely on when they're going to want to rely on capital to take advantage of an opportunity or an unplanned life event that they truly want to act on. And so we have this wealth coordination account set up and the idea is that we have an intelligent conversation around cash flow and savings rate and inflows and outflows. And once we determine what they truly want to be able to spend for money for today, we would have that money continue to flow in their personal operating account, right? Their personal checking account. Mm -hmm. And then the money that they want to save for tomorrow, which we would refer to as their savings rate, we would have that flow into a separate checking account. And we refer to that as this wealth coordination account. And we understand that it doesn't happen right away where they're, you know, maybe right up to that 20 percent optimal savings rate takes a little bit of time we shift some behavior we create some awareness around how much they how much money they truly want for today in relationship to how much money they want for tomorrow and if we could just bifurcate this cash flow this money coming in and have some of it you know probably the majority of it would go towards money for today and some of it go for money for tomorrow into this wealth coordination account it becomes an, an extremely effective way for people to manage cash flow well you're talking about shifting behavior Justin can you uh, this is one of the those things that truly makes you unique and different as a financial advisor. What do you do to shift the behavior? I mean, this this really is a big behavioral shift for a lot of people, and you've been successful at this in the past. So would you mind giving us a, a little bit of an example or an idea on how you change people's interaction and understanding about various inefficiencies and what they can do with these wealth coordination accounts and other accounts that they have with you? We always have to start with this thing called awareness. We've talked about it in the past. We're going to continue to talk about it. And so we need to create awareness on what is truly happening currently. So what we do is we spend a lot of time with the client on what their current cash flow, their current lack of planning might look like should they stay the course on what they're doing. And so what we do is we play out, we kind of forecast, we project to a certain extent what life is going to look like if they stay their current course. And so we allow the client to self-discover if the future results are going to be in line with what their intended intended objectives may be. And you know, we don't take the position that it's good or bad. We just allow the client to determine if that's in line with what they want because most people walk in the streets blindly make decisions and not truly understand what the consequences come, what the consequences will be. As as a result of the decision that they're about to make or that they have made. And so we start with the awareness. We play out that movie. We play out their current way in which they're approaching their, their money decisions. And then I think 100% of the time, clients don't truly understand all the implications that may come with their decisions. And it's because of the comprehensive nature of our conversation and mm-hmm. the scope in which we are able to talk about planning that we're then able to embark on a different conversation, a different approach a different paradigm, which then we start to spend time on and help them see what it looks like as we're 
moving through time or as we're about to move through time, what it's going to look like. And then we're able to allow the client to uh, make an assessment between kind of their current approach and the paradigm and the behavior and the way that they're looking at money in relationship to this different paradigm, this different way of looking at money. And you can ultimately have the ability to empower people to make their own decision based off of what's possible. And a lot of times, if you don't know what's possible, it's hard to really go in that direction. And so that's what we do when we talk about, you know, shifting behavior around cash flow, money in, money out, money for today versus money for tomorrow. And frankly, we're not looking to at any point tell somebody they need a compromise lifestyle today because that's not what we do, right? Mm-hmm. What we're, we're able to do is say, hey, listen, if you continue on the current path and things continue at the rate and the speed and the tempo and the volume at which they're continuing, these are the results that you're going to get. And so people can determine if that's what they want or not. Now, the wealth coordination account doesn't just serve the purpose of having new money that they come into by way of income flow into it, but rather there's also money that's moving on their balance sheet in their personal economy before we meet. So as an example, Matt, we see that a lot of clients don't fully understand that if let's say you don't own a business for a minute here and you have W-2 wages, when you hit the 2017 social security wage base of 127, 200, the next dollar after that, you then don't pay 6.2% payroll tax on. And so if life was fine and the burn rate and everything was comfortable from dollar one up to 127.2, and then from $127,201 on, you're not going to pay or the client's not going to pay 6.2% in the payroll tax. Like, would there be any reason why we shouldn't grab that 6.2% amount and divert it over into this wealth coordination account so that they can truly understand how maybe four or $5,000 in a very conservative you know, example on an annual basis that's diverted north of the social security wage base over to this wealth coordination account and then ultimately onto some sort of growth type account can earn maybe $500,000 as a result of some growth and some time. And so that makes a fairly large impact. That's one example where the wealth coordination account, in addition to capturing new money, would be able to capture, you know, money, the dollars north of the Social Security wage base up to whatever the final income may be at the end of December. You know, we can divert that 6.2 percent over to this wealth coordination account, allow the client to really make a difference in what they're trying to accomplish with their cash flow. So that sounds to me like you're talking a lot about some of the inefficiencies that you had hinted towards early in the podcast. Can you break Break down and unpack some more of those efficiencies that you've been able to show clients that can really make a huge difference on their long-term plans. I know it seems a little bit odd, but we find a lot of times clients are so focused on their investment rate of return, and if it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever it may be, and so let's assume that they're successful in getting whatever the investment rate of return may be, and simultaneously to the success in that investment rate of return, they have short-term debt to the tune of 22%. So it's like, hey, it's great because you're moving ahead 6, 7, 8, 10, 12% on the investments, but you're also got this headwind of 22% interest on short-term debt. And so ultimately you do the math on the spread between 22 and whatever the investment rate of return may be, and there's there's a negative. So they're, they're actually going backwards. So if we can get an understanding of what's happening there and we can start to move in the direction to figure out maybe a way to eliminate that short-term debt, then the monthly cash flow that was previously going to service that short-term debt can be directed to the wealth coordination account and the interest that's now no longer being paid to the tune of 22% is also recaptured well. So when you think about it in that term, I mean, it it becomes a gigantic impact, right? So that's another example of an inefficiency that we see a lot. Uh, We often see that clients don't fully understand that if you have after-tax investments and you're looking at a long-term horizon, call it 15, 20 years or beyond, some of that money is going to produce a taxable event during the first 12 months. And it may be interest or dividends. uh, And so that interest or dividend that the investment, the underlying investment produces, should it continue to get reinvested into that account, it's going to create a gigantic compounding tax effect. Yeah. 
And, and so therefore, we, we want to flatten the tax. So if we can flatten the tax as opposed to compound the tax, it's another inefficiency. So there's a lot of inefficiencies that we find, Matt. Wow. Yeah, that's all very, very eye-opening. So what else do we need to know about money for today and money for tomorrow? I think there needs, just needs to be a balance. I mean, to sum it up, Matt, there's got to be an understanding that there's money for today, which produces lifestyle, and then money for tomorrow, which is going to be the future lifestyle that one may want to live. And that's the point at which it's no longer person at work, but it's money at work. So we need to have a wealth coordination account. We need to have structure. We need to have discipline. We need to have awareness. We start to understand that there's inefficiencies. And when we put all this together, we start to have a very, very large impact on, on one's planning. Fantastic. All right, Justin, well, thank you very much for your thought leadership today. Thanks, Matt. And this has been podcast number eight, Money for Today and Money for Tomorrow. Stay tuned. Lots more fantastic stuff to come.